Hello, hello. Good afternoon, everyone. Have you been enjoying the service so far? Amazing. Daniela, you've been doing a fantastic job. Praise and worship on point as always. Xavier, these in the charge excellently. Um, now, I would greet the lead pastor of the house, but he's not here today because he's uh, enjoying his wife. <laughs> well, big shout out to Omar and Rona. For those of you that were there yesterday, it was an incredible day. Um, I think it's been said already, let's keep them in our prayers, um, that they recharge and they come back strong and unified. Amen? Amen. Now, it was just said, but in case you didn't know, I was uh, one of two best men yesterday. And um, it was an incredible honor to serve as a best man yesterday. Um, but Omar also gave me uh, a second charge, which was to, to deliver the word today. And so um, I'm deeply honored to serve yesterday and to serve again today. Um, but before we do get into the word, um, at the Ark we have a slogan. We keep it radical, we keep it simple, and we keep it real. Uh, and so I do want to keep it real with you before I get into the word today. I really do feel uh, deeply unworthy to be here this afternoon. At the moment, um, I've been facing a lot of turbulence in my personal relationships. Um, and as a result, I'm facing quite a lot of disappointment in myself as well as other people. And I'm nursing myself through that. Um, and as a result, I'm quite emotionally drained. And I wanted to be real and transparent with you so that you know that I'm not up here as someone who is perfect. I'm up here as someone who is a work and a product of grace. You know? So... This morning I was praying and I was asking God to help me to navigate my way through offense while at the same time not offending him. And so right now, instead of focusing on my disappointment and my feelings of unworthiness, this morning I, I resolved in my time with God that I would lean on his grace, I would press forward and I would preach the word. And so as we get into that, I just want to greet the leaders in this house, those who are serving faithfully in Omar's absence. You lot have been doing an amazing job. Thank you for covering me in prayer. Thank you for overseeing the house. Thank you for charging the congregation. Thank you for your faithful service. I want to greet you all in the wonderful name of Jesus, those of you who are here under the sound of my voice in the sanctuary, and those of you that are watching online, greetings in the wonderful name of Jesus. Now, Lewis gave you all a charge in his exhort just now. He said that each of you needed to bring up plus one uh, to church next week. He said, look around at the empty chairs and resolve in yourself that you want to get those chairs filled. And so in my word to you this, this afternoon, I want to help give you um, some oomph in your evangelism. And I want to help tune up your technique. So that way, when next Sunday comes, everyone has their plus one. And so I'm wondering if you would do me the honor of standing with me for the reading of the word. We're taking it from Acts chapter 16. And we're taking it from verse 25. If you have your Bibles with you today, keep uh, Acts 16 open. We're going to be dealing heavily with Acts 16 today. And we'll be jumping around for some places, um, other places in the Bible, but we'll be mainly focusing on Acts 16. So from verse 25... One second. Keep standing. So Acts 16, from verse 25, it reads, About midnight, Paul and Silas were praying and singing hymns to God, and the prisoners were listening to them. And suddenly there was a great earthquake, so that the foundations of the prison were shaken. And immediately all the doors were opened and everyone's bonds were unfastened. When the jailer woke and saw that the prison doors were open, he drew his sword and was about to kill himself, supposing that the prisoners had escaped. 
But Paul cried with a loud voice, Do not harm yourself, for we are all here. And the jailer called for the lights and rushed in, trembling with fear, he fell down before Paul and Silas. Then he brought them out and said, Sirs, what must I do to be saved? And they said, Believe in the Lord Jesus, and you will be saved, you and your household. And they spoke the word of the Lord to him and to all, the, and to all who were in his house. And he took them the same hour of the night and washed their wounds and was baptized at once, he and his family. Then he brought them up into his house and set food before them, and he rejoiced along with his entire household that they had believed in God. But when it was day, the magistrates sent the police, saying, Let those men go. And the jailer reported those words to Paul, saying, The magistrates have sent to let you go. Therefore, come out now and go in peace. But Paul said to them, They have beaten us publicly, uncondemned men who are Roman citizens, and have thrown us into prison, and they now throw us out secretly. No, let them come themselves and take us out. The police reported these words to the magistrates, and they were afraid when they heard that they were Roman citizens. So they came and apologized to them, and they took them out and asked them to leave the city. So they went out of the prison and visited Lydia. And when they had seen the brothers, they encouraged them and departed. Amen? Amen. Father, I just want to thank you for this time to look into your word and to open up its precious truths. Father, I thank you for the honor it is to minister today to your people. Father, you and I both know that I have never done this by myself, and it's never been by my own power or intellect. So once again, I ask that, Father, you would fill me up with your, you would stir me up with your precious Holy Spirit and give me the words for your people today. Father, I pray, let me speak with the boldness and authority of the Holy Ghost. And Father, I pray, open up hearts and ears to hear your word and to receive from you today. Thank you, Father, for hearing us, for we all pray in Jesus' precious name. Amen. Amen. You can take your seats. So as you do that, I'm, as you take your seats, I'm going to give you a quick background for what we're reading here today. We're in Acts 16, and prior to what we've just read, uh, Paul is on his second missionary journey. And on this missionary journey, he was about to go into Asia, um, but he was forbidden by the Holy Spirit from going into Asia, and instead he was directed by a dream to go into Macedonia. In Acts 16, verses 11 to 15, Paul arrives at Philippi, a city in Macedonia, Macedonia, and after a couple of days, he goes down to a place of prayer where he preached the gospel to some women and converted a woman uh, by the name of Lydia. Lydia is a nice name, by the way. <laughs> Lydia, Lydia convinces Paul to stay at, uh, to stay at her house, uh, which she does. And so Paul is staying at the house of Lydia while he is in Philippi. Now, following the conversion of Lydia, Acts 16, verse 16, tells us that Paul goes back down to the place of prayer. We see it in Acts chapter 16, from verse 16 to 18. Let's read it quickly. It says, as we were going to the place of prayer, we were met by a slave girl who had the spirit of divination and brought her owners much gain by fortune telling. She followed Paul and us, crying out, these men are servants of the Most High God, who proclaim the way of salvation. And she kept doing this for many days. Take a note of that. She kept doing it for many days. Paul, having become greatly annoyed, turned and said to the spirit, I command you in the name of Jesus Christ to come out from her. And it came out that very same hour. One of the things that we see here is that this girl had been following Paul for many days. But the Bible says only at this point that Paul now turns and confronts this spirit. Paul essentially became frustrated after many days and was finally compelled to confront the ungodly spirit. So I'm wondering, how long until you become frustrated to start confronting the ungodly spirits that have been plaguing your life? Or I'm wondering, how long will you be watching the telly and seeing the things that are going on around the world before you finally get frustrated to go into the place of prayer and to tarry all the night long? How long before you become frustrated to start confronting the powers of darkness that are operating in your workplace? How long before you become frustrated? 
Paul became frustrated in his spirit that he said enough is enough and he turned to this little girl, he turned to the spirit and had to confront it. But there's more that we see there. Because this little girl was saying, these men are men of the most high God. They, they come in the name of God, they're proclaiming the way to salvation. I don't see any wrong in, anything wrong in those statements. Those statements sound biblical, they sound true, but Paul knew that it was an evil spirit operating behind this little girl. But Paul was not content for his ministry to profit off of ungodly spirits. And so he turned and he confronted that spirit. But how many ministers do we have today that are comfortable to work with ungodly practices and ungodly means and they're profiting for their ministries in the name of God? But Paul said, I will not profit from ungodly means. I will not profit from using lust. Sex sells nowadays, but I'm not going to use, I'm not going to bring out girls on, 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 on the worship team and I'm not going to encourage them to show their cleavage. I'm not going to use ungodly means to attract people into the house of God. Even though the media and even though advertising companies will use sex and will use ungodliness to sell their product, I will not dare use ungodly means to preach the gospel. And so Paul confronted that ungodly spirit. But there's another thing that we see there. Paul was working. He was ministering. He was preaching the gospel. And Paul's ministry was being suppressed. It was being drowned out by the noise of ungodly spirits. The Bible says that there are many voices in the world and none are without significance. You see, the word of the gospel, our word, our voice is being drowned out by voices of homosexuality, by voices of transgenderism, by, pro by voices of racism and all of these things. They're trying to drown out our message. They're trying to distract us and get us focused on other things. But Paul said... I'm going to keep the first thing first. So I'm going to silence this ungodly spirit and I'm going to go back to doing what God has given me to do on this mission. Sometimes we need to stop com competing with the voices around us. Sometimes before you speak, you have to work at silencing the things that are drowning out your voice. So before you go into your workplace, how about committing that place into prayer and saying every ungodly thing in that place that is speaking and drowning out my voice, it must stop and it must silence today. I'm wondering, is anyone in here becoming frustrated? But not to contend with man. Paul didn't speak to the little girl. He spoke to the spirit that was behind her. Some of us are wrestling with flesh and blood. But it's not, it's not your line manager. It's not your family member. It's not your uncle. Sometimes there is a spirit at work behind the thing. And sometimes you need spiritual eyes to see behind the thing. And you need a spiritual declaration inside to speak to a thing to bring it to silence. Acts 16 verses 19 to 22. But when her owners saw that their hope of gain was gone, they seized Paul and Silas and dragged them into the marketplace before the rulers. And when they had brought them to the magistrates, they said, these men are Jews and they are disturbing our city. They advocate customs that are not lawful for us as Romans to accept or practice. The crowd joined in attacking them and the magistrates tore their garments off them and gave orders to beat them with rods. But here's the thing. Remember, we just read that Paul had been there and at least we know for a couple of days because this little girl had been following him. Paul had not been silent these couple of days. He had already converted Lydia and he had already preached to some women. So one thing that we do know is that Paul had been working and operating in Philippi for some time now. But it was only until Paul had spoke and confronted this spirit behind this little girl that the people became frustrated. Until then, Paul, they were happy for Paul to keep preaching. Until then, they were happy for Paul to keep talking about the gospel and sharing his faith. But as soon as Paul's gospel interfered with their business, they became angry. You see, people are cool with you preaching the gospel until you mess with their idols. The gospel is offensive because the gospel is not simply an appeal to believe in Jesus, but it is an appeal to accept him as Lord. They're happy with your Jesus as long as you serve him. They're happy with your Jesus as long as you keep worshipping him in the corner. They're happy with your Jesus until you say, but no, he's your Jesus too and you have to accept him as Lord. And so they became offended. You see, to preach an impact gospel is to preach a gospel which causes a clash of two kingdoms in the life of all those who hear let me explain you see Jesus preached the gospel of the kingdom and this is something that sometimes we miss 
We seem to think that the gospel is just Jesus says he went to the cross, he died, he buried. This is true. But if this is the case, how was Jesus able to preach the gospel whilst, whilst he was still living? You see, Jesus preached the gospel of the kingdom. Mark chapter 1 verses 14 to 15 says, Now after John was arrested, Jesus came into Galilee, preaching the gospel of the kingdom of God and saying the time is fulfilled and the kingdom of God is at hand. When you look at it in the Greek and the Hebrew, he's actually saying the gospel of the kingdom is, is near, it's in your face. The gospel of the kingdom is here. He's saying, I am the kingdom, right? He's saying the gospel of the kingdom is at hand. The time is fulfilled. He says, and then he says, repent and believe in the gospel. What is the gospel? You see, Jesus was preaching the gospel of the kingdom, and the gospel of the kingdom is this, to believe and have faith in God's word. And remember, Jesus, we learn in John, was the word made flesh. This is how the two things come, coincide. But when he says repent and believe, it is to repent from your old ways and to turn back to God and to follow him in his direction, according to his instruction, according to his commandments. You see, the difference is Jesus preached the gospel of the kingdom because he was not yet revealed as king. Remember, when Jesus would do miracles, he would charge them and say, do not tell anyone who I am. Do not tell anyone I'm the Messiah. Because there was a time and season that had to be fulfilled before Jesus would go to the cross. And I'm getting there in a second. You see, we preach the gospel of the king. Romans chapter 10, verses 9 says, If you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart, that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. This is the gospel of the king, to believe in Jesus. Jesus preached, repent, believe in the, king, believe in the gospel, and turn from your ways and follow the commandments of God. We, we preach, believe in, turn from your ways and turn to Jesus, right? But the two are one and the same. They're two sides of the same coin, right? Two perspectives of the same gospel. Let me uh, give you an example. Philippians chapter 2, verses 10 to 11 says... So that, the name of, so that at the name of Jesus, every knee should bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth, that every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of the Father. We see there that the king is the name, is Jesus, right? And the kingdom is every knee bowing. Basically, Jesus is the king and his kingdom is an extension of himself. When we declare salvation is by belief in Christ's death, burial and resurrection this is more than a salvific formula sometimes you go out there and they say to you unless you say that you must believe in Jesus's death burial and resurrection you haven't really preached the gospel and they and they get you caught up on all of these semantics but it's more than just semantics there's a reason why you have to believe in Jesus's death burial and resurrection because these three these things point to his his his, his deity it points to his royalty it points to his lordship it points to him as king The king enacts his kingdom. Jesus is king. The king enacts his kingdom, and the kingdom is an extension of the king. And when we preach that Jesus, uh, when we preach his death, burial, and resurrection, it's more than just a statement of faith, and it's more than just basic beliefs. If you go to Acts chapter 2, this was the time when the, the gospel as we know it was first preached on the day of Pentecost. If you look at verses 29 to 33, 33, it says, Brothers, I may say to you with confidence about the patriarch David, that he both died and was buried in his tomb, and his tomb is with us to this day. Being therefore a prophet, this is Peter speaking about the King David in the Old Testament. He says, David being a prophet and knowing that God had sworn with an oath to him that he would set one of his descendants on a throne, he foresaw and spoke of the resurrection of Christ that he would not be abandoned in Hades, nor would his flesh see corruption. That Jesus was raised, God raised up, that we are all witnesses. Being therefore exalted on the right hand of God, and having received the Father, the promise of the Holy Spirit, he poured out this day that you yourselves are seeing and hearing. Peter was saying that back in the Old Testament, David received a prophecy that one day one of his descendants would sit on his throne and that by Christ raising from the dead, that was the fulfillment of that prophecy. And so when we say that Jesus Christ rose from the dead, what we are saying is that Jesus Christ fulfilled the prophecy of David and he is that descendant that would sit on that throne and his kingdom would know no end. And so when we say believe in Jesus, we're really saying believe in the king. And if we're saying believe in Jesus as Lord, we're saying that if you believe in the king, you must believe he has a kingdom. And if we go back to Jesus preaching the kingdom he said to be part of my kingdom you must repent and you must believe and so these days some people say 
that there is no need to repent. There is no way, there is no need to turn from your ways. There is no need to turn for, to, to obey the commandments of God. They say that you're just being religious, but I tell you that Jesus told you to repent. And if Jesus told you to repent, you have to repent. We're Christians, right? Christ followers. So we preach the gospel how Jesus preached the gospel. And so the gospel isn't just believe in Jesus, he's going to grant you wishes. The gospel is believe in Jesus as Lord. Abandon your wicked ways and turn to God. And so the point, and so the point is this, that in declaring Christ's kingship, we are declared, <laughs> lost my words. In declaring Christ's kingship, we are declaring Christ's kingdom. Matthew chapter 24 verse 14 says, and this, and this gospel of the kingdom will be proclaimed throughout the whole world as a testimony to all nations, and then the end will come. Before Jesus returns, before the end comes, the Bible tells us here as a prophetic word that the gospel of the kingdom must be proclaimed throughout the world. So as you proclaim the gospel, recognize that your gospel needs to proclaim his kingdom, needs to proclaim his lordship, needs to proclaim his rule. To declare the kingdom of God in the domain of the enemy, because remember the Bible says that the God of this world is the devil. And so to, to declare the kingdom of God in the domain of the enemy, where its citizens belong to the kingdom of darkness, is an offense to them that are bound and a declaration of war to them that bind them. If you come into someone else's neighborhood, you know, when I was in, when, you know, before I was saved, uh, man used to do the roll thing, you feel me? And one thing you couldn't do is you couldn't go to an area that wasn't your own postcode. To go to someone else's area and to flag your own kingdom is a declaration of war. And so to declare God's kingdom in the kingdom of darkness is a declaration of war. It's warfare. The gospel is good news to the captives, but only once they have received the revelation that they are bound. 1 Corinthians chapter 1 verse 18 says, For the word of the cross is folly to those who are perishing, but to us who are saved, who are being saved, it is the power of God. Your gospel is good news, but only because you know it. But when you preach it to someone else, that thing is folly. That thing is offensive. It's only good news to them once they come to the revelation of the cross. And so what we see in Acts chapter 16 verses 19 to 22 is what we see today. Your Jesus, your Christianity and your message is fine as long as your kingdom doesn't collide with mine. And so, to the, and so the believer has two options in a world that we live in today. They can either preach a gospel that clashes or a gospel that compromises. Your gospel can either clash with the kingdom of darkness or your gospel can compromise with it. Your gospel can compromise with the spirit of the age which says there is no longer male and female. Your gospel can compromise with the age which says that same-sex attraction is what it is. Your gospel can compromise with the age which says that everyone can say what they are and, 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 and everyone can make up rules and lifestyles for their own. Your gospel can compromise in those ways. But if your gospel is to collide, if your gospel is to clash, if your gospel is to be biblical, your gospel must align with Christ's kingdom. Acts chapter 16 verses 23 to 24. And when they had inflicted many blows upon them, they threw them into prison, ordering the jailer to keep them safely. Having received this order, he put them into the inner prison and fastened their feet in the stocks. So they had become angry because now Paul's gospel had, the gospel that Paul was preaching had now offended, had now affected or had now um, collided with their business. And so they dragged Paul to the magistrate's courts. And as a result, Paul and Silas, they were put into prison. Now, now notice what it says there. It says, they put them in the inner prison and fastened their feet in stocks. I don't know about you, but that stands out to me. They're not just in prison, they're in the inner prison. And they're not just in the inner prison, their feet are also in stocks. Right? They threw them into the inner prison, yet they still felt compelled to bind their feet. And I'm sure this was common practice back then, probably, yeah? But I can't help but feel that this detail is significant. 
that this detail that is significant that their feet were bound. I think it's significant because in Romans chapter 10, verses 14 to 15, it says, How then will they call upon him whom they have not believed? And how will they believe in him whom they have never heard? And how will they hear without someone preaching? And how will they preach unless they are sent? As it is written, how beautiful are the feet of those who preach the good news. Paul and Silas had brought the gospel to Philippi in a city city in Macedonia. And they had brought through there and they had... And as a result of their declaration, they had upset the customs and the practices and the kingdom that was working in Philippi. And so this gospel had to be stopped. And so for Paul and Silas, they dragged them through the market, but they kept on preaching. And from you and I, and for you and I, they drag us on social media. They drag us on social media. They drag us in friendship groups. They drag us in social spaces, but we keep on preaching. With Paul and Silas, they brought them to court, but they kept on preaching. With you and I, they report us. They tried to get us fired from work and kicked out from uni. And they tried to block us from certain industries, but we keep on preaching. With Paul and Silas, they beat and they mishandled them, but they kept on preaching. And with you and I, they they, they abuse us and and they, uh, they abuse us and they mistreat us, but we keep on preaching. And so what what does the enemy do? when they try all their tricks and their schemes, when they abuse us, when they malign us, when they drag us through the streets, but we keep on preaching. What do we do when we can't stop the gospel coming from their lips? What can we do when we can't silence their declaration? What can we do when we can't stop their mouths? Well, eventually, if we can't stop their mouths, we will bind their feet. Because how beautiful are the feet of those who preach the gospel? And so the title of my message to you today is The Bonds of Witness. And my message today is broken up to you in three parts. Part one, the worship in the way. Part two, the gospel in the defense. And part three, point three, the witness in the bonds. The worship in the way, the gospel in the defense, and the witness in the bonds. Let's move quickly. Point one, the worship in the way. Acts chapter 16, verses 25 to 29. We've read it, but let's read it again and remind ourselves. It says, about midnight, Paul and Silas were praying and singing hymns to God. And the prisoners were listening to them, and suddenly there was a great earthquake, so that the foundations of the prison were shaken. And immediately all the doors were opened, and everyone's bonds were unfastened. When the jailer woke and saw that the prison doors were open, he drew his sword and was about to kill himself, supposing that the prisoners had escaped. But Paul cried with a loud voice, Do not harm yourselves, for we are all here. And the jailer called for the lights and rushed in, and trembling with fear, he fell down before Paul and Silas. So in this part of the account, Paul and Silas were worshipping and supplicating in the prison. It was an appeal to God and it was a witness to man. Because the Bible tells us in the passage that we just read that the prisoners were listening to them. And so their worship was being heard by God but it was also being heard by the people around them. And and what we see there and the point uh, that I want to give you next is that the world is listening to you and watching you. And your character is assessed by how you respond. Romans chapter 5, verses 3 to 5 says, Not only that, but we rejoice in our sufferings, knowing that suffering produces endurance, and that endurance produces character, and that character produces hope, and that hope does not put us to shame, because the love, the God's love has been poured out into our hearts through the Holy Spirit who has been given to us. How you respond in difficult situations is an evidence of your endurance, which produces character, which produces hope, which testifies of your love for God in your heart. The world is watching, looking at you, listening to how you respond. How do you respond when you don't get that job that you know you deserve? How do you respond when they treat you difficult at workplace? How do you respond when your family members are are bullying you and treating you in ways that you don't deserve? How do you respond when you're facing bereavement and hardships and difficulties? The world is watching and listening. Do you grieve different? Do you face disappointment different? Do you take failure different? How do you respond in the face of adversity? Because it shows the level of endurance that you have. And when someone has a ridiculous amount of endurance, have you ever seen one of those sprinters and they're running for so long and you're thinking, how can you run for so long? And then you think, what do you do? How do you train yourself? What what do you eat? 
How long do you spend on the treadmill? And people will be looking into their regime, trying to learn how they can be fit like you. You want people to look at you and say, how can your endurance be so strong? What makes your endurance so tough? What makes you able to stand in the face of adversity the way you do? What gives you this hope? What makes you have this hope inside of you? And then they understand that you have a hope. And then they start to wonder, how can you love God so much? But what about the hardships and the difficulties that you see in the world? How can you say that this God is so good? don't you see how God don't you see how there are disasters in the world how do you do and then you have a moment to preach the gospel have you ever watched one of those adverts uh, I don't know um, I, I'm gonna, I don't know if I'm showing my age here I'm, ne- I'm, not, I'm not 30 yet but I'm getting there um, back when I was when we was younger maybe still today I don't know there used to be this advert um, about Marmite and they used to say it's like uh, I can't remember the slogan that they had but Marmite is supposedly this nasty thing, and they used to have this thing, you either hate it or you love it, right? And the, and the power of the advert was that this thing that was notoriously bitter and bad, some people love it, and it makes you want to try it. it. It makes you want to try it, that maybe I might like it too, right? When the world sees you love something, the world hears them talking about God. They blame God for disasters. But when you love God the way that you do, and it's so visible, it makes them want to taste and try. And you know what the Bible says in the Psalms? That they should come, taste, and see that the Lord is good. But there's more in this passage. There's so much more. One other thing that we see in this passage is that posture provides perspective. Romans chapter 8 verses 28 says, And we know that for those who love God, all things work together for good for those that are called according to his purpose. And, and sometimes when you see a verse like that, you wonder, but how do you understand what good God is working in any given situation? How can you be in the prison, and not just in prison, but the innermost prison, and not just in the innermost prison, but my feet are in stocks? How can you work out what God is doing for good in a situation like this? How do you work out what God is doing for good when people all around you are dying, when you're losing your job? How do you work out what's going on for good when there's family, family trauma, there's, there's, family, there's fa- family dysfunction? How do you work out what God is doing for good? But I'm telling you, post- a worship provides perspective. Your posture provides you with perspective. Let me give you a quick story. I remember when I was learning how to drive. Um, I don't know, some of you might have heard me use this analogy before. When I was learning how to drive, I used to live on um, this, uh, a bit of a hill. So um, it was a downward slope. And one day, my driving instructor, he pulled up onto the road and he parked on my road, which is a downward slope. Normally, what would happen is I would get into the car in the passenger seat. He would drive off. We would go to a place where it's less busy with traffic. I would get in and I would start driving. But on this occasion, I'd been learning for quite some time and he wanted me now to get into the car on that position. And so I had a, a, a task in front of me. I needed to get into this car and I needed to pull off and I needed to go, enter into the, into the main road, all right? But there was an issue. Where he had parked, he had parked in between two cars. So there was a car in front of me and there was a car behind me. So I got in, did everything, put the uh, key in the ignition, started up the engine. And before I even brought my clutch up to the bike, I was learning manual. Big up to all you manual drivers. Automatics, lazy. <laughs> but before I prepped the car, I started to turn the steering wheel. And he said, whoa, whoa, whoa what are you doing? I said, I, when I pull off, I want to make sure that I miss, don't hit the car in front of me, right? But he said, no. He said, never do that again. He said, if you turn the car when the car is not in motion, you're going to damage the car. So what he said to, you, said to me is, you need to pull off with just enough speed to turn the car away, all right? You can't be going too fast or you're going to hit the car in front of you, but you can't turn too slow, otherwise you're going to damage the vehicle. And I had a powerful revelation in that moment. Because sometimes, in fact, all times, you need, God wants you in some type of motion, apart from when he's calling you to be still. Because if God tries to turn you into purpose and destiny and you're not moving at all, the, the, the weight and the gravity of that calling, if he's to turn you while you're not in motion yet, can damage you. But at the same time, if you run too fast ahead of God, you're going to collide into something in front of you. And so the technique is to pull off with just enough speed so that God can direct you as you're in motion. Because God wants to protect his investment. He doesn't want to damage you as his son and daughter. So you need to have a little bit of movement. So... If we're now trying to discover what is God's will in any given situation, 
What we now need to figure out is what type of motion can we have while we're looking for God to direct us? First, First Thessalonians chapter 5, verses 18. Give thanks in all circumstances, for this is the will of God in Christ Jesus for you. You might not know how to get around that difficult obstacle. You might not know where God wants to take you next in terms of your career. You might not know how to preach to your family members who are obstinate in their, in, and, they're, and they're hard into God. You might not know what to do next, but one thing you do know is to give worship in all circumstances. And so Paul and Silas knew, I might be in prison and they're in the most prison and my feet in the stocks. I might be bound right now, but one thing I do know is that if I give worship to God in this situation, I know that I'm going to be hitting God's will. And if I'm in some type of motion, God can give me direction for my steps to do next you see when you are so boggled down by your circumstances when you're looking at the fact that you're in the prison and in the innermost prison and your feet are in the stocks when you're looking at the stocks your your feet your head is down and that way you can't see God but the Bible says fix your eyes onto Jesus, the author and perfecter of your faith. Because if you fix your eyes onto Jesus, it helps your ears to be open so you can hear his small, still voice. And so worship helps to keep you in motion because it picks your eyes off your feet and it helps you to get one foot in front of the other. So that way I'm worshiping. God, I know it's hard, but I give you thanks. God, I know it's difficult, but I worship your holy name. And in that moment of worship, you start to get clarity about your situation. He starts to open your eyes about things that you didn't quite see before. He starts to show you things that you missed on the first instance when you fix yourself in a posture of worship. Let me show you what happened when Paul did it. Sometimes we read for the Bible and we read for it so quickly. But one thing that stood out to me is that when the prison doors open and he thought the prisoners escaped, the very first thing the jailer thought to do, for, to do in that situation was to kill himself. And, and Maybe it's because his, his bosses were so hard and he knew, oh, I've messed up. I'm, I'm as good as dead. Or maybe, and I'm not, it's all an inference on the scripture, but I just want to make a point. What if that jailer was on the point of suicide? What if he just needed one more thing to go wrong? What if I just need, I just need someone to, just one more thing to go wrong and I, I'm done it. The kids are at home, they're giving me a hard time. I don't know where my next paycheck is coming from, that it's not enough to support them. I just need one more thing. To, oh my days, the prison doors are open. I've had enough, I'm gone. And sometimes, because of our own situation and because of our own perspective as Christians, we're so focused on ourselves when the Bible tells us to be focused on God and our neighbours. We think about ourselves first in, in, in situations. And so we be rude to people when they're being difficult to us. But what if that was that last moment? What if that person that cut you off in traffic, that you slowed down to wind down your window and to cuss them out through the window, what if it was just one more thing? I need one more thing, one more person to give me a hard time and I'm going to kill myself. What if you knew the consequences of your actions? But Paul and Silas knew exactly what to do. That when, you know, Paul was in the, in, the, in, the, in, the, in the most prison. That jailer was outside. But as soon as, the jailer didn't come inside, you know, because the Bible says that he turned on the lights and he rushed in. You following me? Which means that Paul did not have a visual on the jailer. But because Paul was in the posture of worship, he knew exactly what to say. He said, do not kill yourself because we're all still in here. You see, when you have a posture of worship, you have the, you have the vantage point of God. When you're down here, all you see is what's down here. But when you go to a higher place, you have a bigger view of what's going on around you. And so Paul and Silas, they knew exactly what to say because they had God's bird's eye view. Another interesting thing that we see here is that the prisoners did not escape. Think about it. We've got hardened criminals in the, in our, in the, in the most prison. And the Bible says that all of their shackles came off and the play, prison doors fl flinged open. Not just Paul and Silas, mind. All of theirs. But Paul said, all of us are still in here, meaning that the prisoners did not escape. Let's break it down with biblical interpretation. Nahum chapter 1 verse 5 says, Mountains quake because of him, and hills dissolve. Indeed, the earth is upheaved because of his presence, the world and the inhabitants of it. Paul and Silas will worship him. You see, when we are worshipping in this house, we're not just singing pretty songs to look good. We're ushering in the presence of God. And it's not that God's presence ever leaves us, but it's attuning our sensitivity to his presence. And it's giving him, it's giving him the unction to operate. It's saying, Lord, I'm ready for you to move and to work in this place. And Paul and Silas, they were worshipping. And they were stirring up the, pre the presence of God in the prison. 
And as a result of God's presence being ushered into the place, the Bible shows us that the mountains quake. It tells us that the, that it tells us that the earth is upheaved. So there was an earthquake that opened the doors. 2 Corinthians chapter 3, verse 17 says, Now the Lord is that spirit, and where the spirit of the Lord is, there is freedom. And so the spirit of God is in a place, and where the spirit of God is, there is liberty, there is freedom. And so prison doors had to open up. Prison doors had to open up. When the presence of God is in the room, I'm telling you, if you're bound in any way, when the presence of God comes in, when the spirit of God comes in to stir you up on the inside, when there are doors that are closed, doors will be open. When you're abound, shackles have to come loose. Because where the Spirit of God is, there is liberty. And so the doors had to open. John chapter 16 verse 8 says, And when he comes, he will convict the world concerning sin and righteous, righteousness and judgment. We say, when we have people come into here, if we preach grace, 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 and we talk about Jesus, and we're not hard, and we don't give religion, and we don't give rules, people are just going to feel like they can just treat God anyhow, and people, but the, um, um, the Bible says, what shall we say, say then? Shall we continue in sin that grace may abound? God forbid. And so where, and so, and so, and so where the Spirit comes in, he, the Bible says he convicts or, or the world concerning sin and righteous judgment. So when the Spirit of God came in, the doors had to be opened. But not only did the doors open, but those prisoners were convicted. Suddenly they realized their sin. Suddenly they realized that they were supposed to be in there. So even though the doors opened, they remained where they were. And so you don't need to worry about how they're going to react to the message of grace. You just preach the Holy Ghost and he will do the rest. Hallelujah. And so while you're waiting, you need to worship. Point number two, the gospel in the defense, and we'll get through this one really quickly. Acts chapter 16, verses, Acts chapter 16, verses 29 to 33. And the jailer called for the lights and rushed in, and trembling with fear, he fell down before Paul and Silas. And then he brought them out and said, Sirs, what must I do to be saved? And they said, Believe in the Lord Jesus, and you will be saved, and your household. And they spoke the word of the Lord to him, and, and those who were in his house. And then they took them the same hour of the night and washed their wounds, and he, and he was baptized at once, he and all his family. The jailer asked to Paul, asked Paul, what must I do to be saved? We've heard it quoted already. First Peter 3.15. In your hearts, honor Christ as Lord, as holy, always being prepared to make a defense to anyone who asks you for the reason for the hope that is in you, yet doing it with gentleness and respect. The word in, 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 the, um, in the passage here, defense, is apologia. Always being ready to give. That's where we get the word apologetics from, right? That's why it's necessary to study these things. How do you defend the faith? How do you defend the gospel? The Bible says, how can you be ready? But here's the thing. You can buff up your technique, and you can get all your theory inside your head. You can study theology, and you can get all your answers ready for your Muslim colleague, for your atheist colleague. But here's the thing, what happens if they don't ask you any questions? You see, the thing is, the way you live your life has to prompt a question. Even if you're the one in instigating the conversation. You know, sometimes your behavior and your attitude and your lifestyle can be so off-putting that when you speak to people, they don't even want to hear you. When you go up to them, you've got a frown on your face. You go up to them and it's like it's a chore. But when you go up to them, go up to them with the joy of the Lord, you've got a smile. When they see your lifestyle in your workplace, they see that you're hardworking. They see that the joy of the Lord is always in you. When you now talk to them, if they don't come to you first, they want to know, why are you the way that you are? And so, they, and so your defense, they now ask you and now you can now use your defense. Remember what we just read in Romans chapter 5, verses 3 to 5. Not only that, but we rejoice in our sufferings, knowing that suffering produces endurance, and endurance produces character, and character produces hope, and hope doesn't put us to shame, because God's, God's love has been poured out in our hearts through the Holy Spirit who has been given to us. Paul and Silas's worship displayed endurance, which testified of their character, which pointed to their hope, which witnessed of the love that they had for their God, which prompted the jailer to ask, which... For the jailer to ask, what must I do to be saved? Which set up Paul's apologia for the gospel. Sometimes your technique, how you, put, how you preach the gospel in, in your workplace, in your home, is sometimes first it's about your character and your lifestyle. And so the question is, does your character testify of the hope that you have in Jesus? Does it compel others to ask for the reason of your hope? A reason for your joy? A reason for your peace? A reason for your love? Point three, the witness in the bonds. 
and we're going to round this up. Acts 16, 3, verses 34 to 37. Then he brought them into the house and set food before him. This is the jailer. He took them to his house, he set food before them, and he rejoiced along with his entire household that he believed in God. But when it was day, and the magistrate sent the police saying, let those men go, and the jailers reported these words to Paul saying, the magistrates have sent to let you go, therefore come out now and go in peace. But Paul and Silas said to them, they have beaten us publicly, uncondemned men who are Roman citizens and have thrown us into prison, and do they now want to throw us out secretly? No. Let them go and send us out. So do you know what's interesting, actually, when you look at this verse? Paul and Silas had gone to the jailer's house. So they had, been, they had come out of the prison. The jailer had come to them in the morning and had said to them, listen, you need to go back into the... You need to be, you're free to go. You don't have to go. Paul and Silas said, no, we're going to go back into the jail cell. Does that make sense? He said, no. Paul said, no, we're actually going back into the jail and then they can come and let us out of jail. Imagine you've been freed from your circumstances and your situation, and instead of you running for the hills, you go right back into it. And I can only fathom, I can fathom two reasons for why Paul did this. One, it was for his public witness. The Bible says in Romans 14, verses 16 to 18, that let not your good be evil spoken of. Paul said, I'm not going to let them malign my character by having me... I'm not going to let them malign my character... By having me look here like a public criminal, they're going to have to come and they're going to have to take me out so I can claim my good name. The second thing that we see is that Paul had a private purpose. In other words, he had a personal purpose. So he had a public witness to think about, but he always also had, he also had a private purpose to think about as well. And so the Bible says in Philippians that he says, he's writing a letter to the church and he says, these things have happened to me so that the gospel might go further. Paul knew that his hardships and his suffering were about God's purposes being fulfilled and God's purposes going out. And so Paul said, even though it was a tough night in prison, I'm going right back in there because I need to protect my public witness and I need to preserve my private purpose. And so this is where we're going to end because of time. Paul and Silas, in the power of their Liberty and freedom subjected them to bonds for witness. And so I'm wondering, is anyone in here free from the bonds of wealth? So that you can go back into the finance sector and that you can get wealth and you can get money, but it doesn't corrupt you or, 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 or finish you, but it allows you to give your money to charity. It allows you to give your money to affect the kingdom and to give to charity. I'm wondering, is, in there, is in, anyone in here free from the bonds of depression? So that you can now go back to those that are depressed. You can now go back into depressive spaces and minister to those who have been through situations just like you. I'm wondering, is anyone in here free from the bonds of addiction so you can now begin to minister? I know that it was a long few years of battle and you're ashamed, but I'm wondering, are you free from addiction and now you can own your testimony and now you can begin to minister to people who are going through similar situations to you and begin to speak back to them? I'm wondering, is anyone in here free from the bonds of an abusive childhood? That now you can take the things that you learn through pain and you can begin to minister through love to children who need your support. I'm wondering, is, is, is anyone in here free from the bonds of the hood? Shout out to the greens of God out there. I want to. That you can now go back to places where they are crippled in the same ways that you once were and you can communicate to them in ways that they can understand. I'm wondering, is it there anyone in here who has been freed from bonds by the grace of God and now has the strength and the power of the Holy Ghost to go back into those situations and begin to minister freedom to those who need to hear the gospel? Now, I'm going to have to honor Tom and we're going to wrap it up there. I've said a lot of things to you today. A lot of things, I know. But the point is this. God has freed you from bonds. But the Bible says that we are still in our earthen bodies. Paul said, who shall liberate me from this body of death? While we are on the earth, we are going to have struggles and trials. But God has done such a miraculous work inside of you. And God is continuing to do that miraculous work inside of you. That even though the things in this world are trying to pull you apart, his grace can hold you together. But for you to have that strength, for you to have the bond of Christ that allows you to go into the bonds of the world, you first need to be bound to him. 
You first need to be bound to the Savior. You first need to be bound to the one who is the king of this kingdom. And so quickly, stand with me. Close your eyes, bow your heads. And ponder on this question. What could cause men who were bound in prison in the innermost prison with their feet in stocks to go back into a place they had been freed from? Only God's love can do that. And so if God's love can send them back into prison, God's love is able to sustain you and keep you in anything that you might be going through right now. And this isn't a prosperity message. This is biblical truth. That God is greater than it all. And if you yoke yourself to Christ, you will have the strength and the grace to make it through anything you might presently be facing. And so if you now want to bind yourself to this Christ and yoke yourself to this God, now is your chance and your moment. Don't go back into the bonds of the weak by your own strength and by your own power. Go in there yoked to the one who is God. And so if you want to bind yourself to this God, if you want to accept Jesus as your personal Lord and Savior, all you have to do is signify by giving me a hand. I'll give you five seconds because we have a baptism and I need to close up and get out of your way. Amazing. So then this is what I'm going to pray for us all. That the Lord would keep us, no matter what we are going through. The Lord would keep us bound to him and our eyes fixed on him. And that he would carry us through and help us to navigate our ways through our circumstances. Father, I thank you for the opportunity to speak to your people today. To preach and to get forth your word. Father, I'm praying somewhere in this message, let everyone take away something that would bless them. Encourage them and strengthen them for the week ahead. Father, I'm asking, Lord God. As we have bound ourselves to you and we are held together by your perfect grace. Lord Jesus, give us the strength and hold us together through whatever it is that we may be facing this week. Help us to love when it is difficult. Help us to forgive when it is difficult. Help us to recognize that all things work together for good when it is difficult. Help us, oh God, to keep moving forward, to keep worshiping, to keep holding on to you even when it is difficult. And that, Lord, I pray by how we posture ourselves, the world may see that you are God and that the world might be convicted. In the mighty name of Jesus, we pray. Keep us now as we go. Blessed be your name, we pray. For I pray in Jesus' name. Amen.